So, welcome everybody to our today's talk about universal CNN accelerator in Team for Edge based AI influence. Our today talker is Ratislav Stru Harik from the University of Novi Sad. We want to thank um, every TinyML talk sponsors. Without them, fin uh, financial help, we are not supposed to do the um, TinyML talks for free. We want to thank ARM, Deep Light, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, Kixo, Re Reality AI, and SynSense. And if you interested to uh, be a sponsor, please contact Olga at tinyml.org for more information. Our, no, our next TinyML talk uh, will be from Bernhard Sam. He's a machine learning product manager at MathWorks, and he will talk about deploying AI to embedded systems on Tuesday, April the 1st. And the web, uh, webcast will start at 8 a.m. In, in Pacific time. Um, if you're interested by have a talk by yourself, please contact talks at tinyml.org. Yes, our local committee in Germany um, is supported by four members. We have Alexis, he is um, an engineer at Definian. Then we have Carlos, he, I think he's here. Hi, hello everyone. Yes, this is Carlos Hernandez Vaquero. I work as, uh, um, at Bosch as technical project manager and my interest areas are AI and IoT. We started the, the German TinyML community group last summer in the middle of the pandemic, which means that so far we only met virtually, but we hope to start meeting in person again. Um, well, anytime soon. We, we hope soon, but we will see with the, um, with the vaccination and so on. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, back to you. Thank you, Carlos. And then we have um, Professor Dr. Daniel Müller Kritschner. Kritschner, he is um, the interim head of chair of real-time computer systems. He's group leader in the ESL, chair of electronics design optimization, and professor in the Uni Technical University of München. Last person is me, Markus Rieb. I'm a researcher in the field of TinyML and um, working as a researcher at Hans Schickert uh, Research Institute in the south of Germany. So let's come to our today's talker, Ratislav Struharik. He's a full professor at the Department of Power Electronics and Telecommunication in the University of Novi Sad in Serbia. He received his PhD in electronics in 2009 in the area of hardware acceleration of machine learning algorithm. During his academic career, he has published a, um, many papers about decision trees, support vector machines, um, convolutional neural networks, and other machine learning algorithm. And since three years, he's the chief architect for IDS, where he developed an FPGA IP core to uh, accelerate convolutional neural networks on hardware. And now it's up to you, Rasislav. Thank you, Markus. Uh, and I first would like to thank TinyML for giving me this opportunity to present the work that we are doing at IDS. So I will be talking today about a universal CNN accelerator that uh, has been developed and is still being developed uh, within the IDS, uh, intended for edge-based uh, AI inference. So uh, we are all aware about the, uh, the rapid progress of, of, of usage of AI algorithms, and every day they are being used in, um, in new applications. Uh, However, uh, most of them, uh, when we are talking about the way they are implemented uh, to serve these applications, uh, they are usually uh, currently implemented uh, within the cloud. And this uh, is true both for the training phase uh, and the inference phase. However, uh, recently and in the future, everybody expects uh, a shift, uh, meaning that more and more AI algorithms, uh, specifically uh, inferencing phase of AI algorithms will be moved uh, to the edge, while the training will still remain on the cloud. So we are uh, at the brink of a of an next revolution, uh, which is called edge AI. 
which is uh, of course extremely promising uh, both from the uh, marketing and uh, business side and also uh, research side. So why uh, would we like to move AI uh, to the edge? So there are basically a couple of reasons. Uh, I will only go briefly uh, to the most through the most important ones. Uh, first of all, uh, if we move AI to the edge, uh, we will have uh, much better results uh, regarding the required bandwidth uh, for transmitting data between the edge device, for example, sensor and the cloud, uh, and also the latency. Uh, if the AI processing is located close to the sensor or on the edge, then there is no need to transmit huge amount of data if you are considering a VISM sensor, like shown in this slide, uh, to the cloud and then doing the inferencing uh, in the cloud and then returning the results back to the sensor or some other actuator. Uh, uh, if you are doing that on the edge, so we are limiting or re removing this, uh, this link. Uh, and then, of course, this uh, significantly reduces the bandwidth. If we want to transmit something back to the cloud, then it will be already this intelligently processed data, uh, which should be much uh, smaller. Uh, and of course, uh, the latency, which is extremely important in real-time applications, will be significantly improved if we don't have to go back to the cloud and then return back to the, to the edge. Uh, another uh, reason why uh, it makes sense to move AI on the edge is uh, security and privacy. Uh, if we are transmitting data over, over some link, uh, of course, then this link uh, can be uh, attacked by some hackers or some malicious software or persons, and uh, our data could be uh, misused. Uh, this also uh, reduces uh, the, 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 the privacy is also, could be also a, a big concern because uh, maybe this data that we are transmitting to the cloud <clears throat> uh, is, is, is uh, sensitive in the, regarding the privacy and we have to somehow protect it. If we are doing the inferencing or processing, AI processing on the edge, then of course both of these things become irrelevant because data never leaves the edge or the sensor. Uh, of course, uh, reliability and availability uh, then increases because uh, um, basically the system is simplified uh, we don't have this uh, uh, communication link that if it goes down link between the uh, edge device and the cloud, then the whole system breaks apart. Uh, if everything is uh, somehow integrated within the edge, then of course the reliability and availability the, of the complete system is significantly increased. Uh, and uh, if we are on the edge, then uh, we have uh, much more opportunity for customized computing, uh, customizing the AI algorithms for specific need for that specific edge device, uh, which can be uh, complicated and costly if we are doing that uh, in the cloud. So these are only the, the, the main reasons why uh, to consider to move AI on the edge, uh, but extremely important ones. Uh, however, on the other side, uh, deploying AI on the edge is not easy uh, because edge computing, as you all know, is all about efficiency. So. Uh, we want uh, low latency, real-time uh, performance under strict compute memory and power uh, budgets. Uh, and this is what uh, makes uh, any edge computing difficult. Uh, moving AI on the edge uh, is even more uh, complicated because uh, current state-of-the-art AI algorithms, and by that I mean uh, convolutional neural networks, are extremely big in terms of uh, memory footprint uh, because these networks, as you all know, uh, are huge, requiring hundreds of millions of parameters. So they require a lot of memory, uh, which could be a concern uh, within the edge devices. Uh, they are also uh, extremely compute hungry because uh, they can require hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of compute operations in order to process one input image. Uh, and all this makes them uh, not very suitable uh, for deploying on the edge. Uh, we, we have to somehow uh, resolve these issues. Uh, so a uh, couple of ways how we, how we could resolve it uh, is basically using uh, a parameter efficient networks. So there are now uh, appearing uh, ever more uh, specialized networks uh, designed to be uh, efficient in terms of memory footprint and uh, compute requirements like mobile net family, efficient net family, squeeze net family, and so on. So uh, if you are considering deploying uh, CNNs on the edge, uh, 
you should consider using uh, networks from these families. Uh, but even that could not be enough. So another way uh, to reduce the memory and compute requirements is performing some sort of network compression. Uh, and this can be done basically in two ways, uh, applying some sort of uh, pruning to your network or uh, applying some sort of quantization where you are uh, basically uh, replacing the floating point representations uh, with the fixed point low bit uh, representations and therefore reducing the memory size required to store all these parameters. But even that is uh, usually not enough. Uh, basically, uh, what is still required or further required is to uh, develop a customized computing solutions, customized computing hardware and software systems that are uh, specifically designed to efficiently process this, uh, these AI algorithms. So there is, uh, as, you, as you can see, a lot of work to be done uh, if we are to successfully and efficiently move or deploy AI on the edge. So uh, because I'm interested in the hardware implementations, uh, what, what options do we have uh, if we are to implement CNNs on the edge? So we can go with the traditional uh, CPU implementation. Uh, which is excellent in terms of uh, supporting different software, deep learning software frameworks. Uh, it can also have some benefit uh, um, when processing these compressed uh, CNN networks, but usually it has high power consumption, high latency and low throughput. Uh, and it's not able to uh, effectively uh, make, make use uh, of uh, different number formats uh, that, uh, could be uh, used uh, within your network, but simply the CPU, because it uses a fixed uh, bitwidth uh, of, the, of its operands, cannot basically uh, benefit from that. Another option would be a GPU uh, system, which also has uh, excellent uh, deep learning software support. So it's easy to write some deep learning code and then compile it uh, to the GPU, GPU and execute it. Uh, of course, uh, GPUs have tremendous throughput. Uh, and uh, to a limit, they can support different number formats, uh, but only to a limit. On the other hand, they, are all, they, they also have drawbacks. Uh, usually that's their high power consumption, uh, high latency values, uh, lack of support for the pruned uh, deep neural networks and uh, short uh, lifespans. Another platform that you could choose is an FPH, FPGA technology. Uh, which is known to be power efficient, uh, much more power efficient than the GPU or CPU, could be made power efficient if you designed uh, the, the system correctly. Uh, it offers low latency and uh, high throughput values, uh, could be designed in that way. Uh, of course, it can support any number format because you are designing the hardware. Uh, and uh, it is relatively easy to support any new advancement in the, in the deep learning field. Uh, new, new types of uh, architectures and uh, so on. But its main drawback, I think it's uh, this, uh, what I call it difficulty to program because it's not easy to uh, develop uh, uh, an FPGA implementation. You have to have this specific hardware knowledge uh, in hardware description languages, hardware design, if you are to really efficiently uh, implement your uh, selected deep learning algorithms using an FPGA technology. So that makes it really, uh, prohibitive uh, for, for example, software developers or, or traditional deep learning uh, guys uh, basically to target the FPGAs. And this is maybe the biggest problem with the FPGAs. And of course, we can select a, a full ASIC implementation, uh, which is extremely power efficient, uh, has superior uh, performances in terms of latency and high throughput, because of course it's, it's custom made uh, for specific type of the algorithm that, it's, uh, that it accelerates. But uh, usually it comes with high development costs. Uh, it takes a lot of effort and resources to develop a new ASIC uh, because it usually has a fixed uh, internal architecture. Uh, it's difficult to easily support and efficiently support any new advancement uh, in the deep learning field. Uh, and uh, at least until now, it offers a limited support uh, for working with these compressed uh, GNNs. So clearly there are a couple of or several alternatives and uh, 
uh, it's still not clear uh, which which path is 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 the best uh, to select when you are uh, deploying your uh, AI algorithm uh, on the edge. Uh, within the IDS, we selected an FPGA technology uh, as a as a platform for deploying the deep learning uh, in our products. And why we believe this is a, a good decision, at least at this moment in time. Uh, first of all, because uh, FPGA technology is highly customizable. Uh, you can always uh, reconfigure the FPGA, uh, download a different configuration bitstream, and you have a new hardware system immediately running on your existing uh, product or system. So uh, this is the main benefit compared to the uh, ASIC solution. Uh, by the same approach, uh, FPGA uh, technology uh, allows uh, building or developing highly optimized uh, architectures, which are, for example, example uh, especially optimized to uh, efficiently execute uh, CNNs. Uh, and that will give you reduced power consumption and uh, improved uh, performance. Usually, the FPGA technology is superior uh, compared to the GPUs uh, in terms of its lifespan, uh, which is interesting in the industrial applications, uh, and that's the main market of the IDS. Uh, it is also uh, more uh, resistant to any rugged uh, settings or environmental factors compared, for example, with the GPUs. Uh, and I think the most important thing, uh, it offers this uh, possibility of reconfiguration, uh, which is an ideal and I think necessary, at least at this stage of the uh, of the AI uh, algorithm development, where the AI algorithms uh, change quickly uh, over the time. Uh, they are not mature yet, and uh, basically fixing the architecture to the current uh, state of the art AI algorithm uh, could be uh, could be costly. If if in I don't know half a year uh, some uh, new results appear and uh, you find your architecture not capable of efficiently executing these new uh, advancements in the AI or deep learning field. But if you are, doing the, if you are using the FPGA technology, of course, uh, that's, that's not a problem. Uh, the problem, of course, is this difficulty to program. So how we have sold it uh, within the IDS? So we are, we are uh, when, when we are talking about the FPGA implementation of the CNNs, we are not using uh, an HLS approach. Uh, we are not synthesizing the FPGA configuration bitstream for each specific uh, CNN that we would like to deploy, for example, on the, on the camera. Uh, no, instead, we have developed uh, one universal architecture. You can, you can think of it as a, as a core, as an IP core, or as a system, uh, which is capable of executing any convolutional neural network, uh, provided that it's uh, composed out of supported layers. Uh, I will talk about this uh, a little bit more later. Uh, so by doing this, uh, we have, at least we strongly believe that we have completely removed this difficult to program issue uh, related with the FPGAs because the end user does not have to have any knowledge about the uh, HDL, languages, uh, digital design methodology, none of that is necessary because you have uh, your FPGA platform, which is configured to become an CN accelerator, an universal CNN accelerator. And all that you need to worry about is how to uh, describe your CNN network that you would like to run uh, in a way that is recognizable by this deep ocean uh, CNN accelerator. And by doing so, uh, you are not actually doing any hardware design. Uh, this is done by us. Uh, on the other hand, because this IP core is implemented on the FPGA platform, uh, we can constantly change uh, its architecture. And this is exactly what we are doing uh, at the IDS. So we are still working on this deep ocean accelerator. Uh, it's still, let me say, it work in progress. Uh, although it's already commercially available and you can buy cameras running deep ocean uh, inside, uh, but because it is uh, an FPGA IP core, uh, we can constantly and continuously improve it, add new support to some new layer types, for example, uh, improve its performance uh, in terms of compute or 
power or whatever. Uh, so this gives us this great flexibility. And this is what we are doing. And you as an end customer uh, simply uh, don't have to worry about that. Uh, you only worry about describing your network and deploying it all on, the, on the accelerator. Uh, and this then uh, basically gives us this opportunity to easily, uh, easily uh, support uh, the newest de deep learning algorithms. Uh, and uh, also uh, we have developed this uh, supporting software tools that allows you to um, relatively easily uh, deploy your CNN networks, which you have modeled in uh, some standard deep learning uh, software environments. We currently uh, support Keras uh, uh, deep learning environment. So if you have your CNN network modeled and trained uh, using Keras uh, and TensorFlow, uh, then it's really easy uh, to deploy it uh, and run it uh, on the uh, deep ocean. And uh, we are also working on supporting different uh, deep learning frameworks. So by doing so uh, in, the, in the future, we will have really excellent deep learning software support, which is also very important. Uh, and now I would like to go briefly about uh, and, and describe how does the CNA implementation flow using deep, learn, deep ocean uh, uh, accelerator looks like. So the first stage, uh, is actually uh, pruning your CNN. So our accelerator is, uh, is designed to operate on the prune networks. Uh, bear in mind, it does not have to be prune networks. So the accelerator can also operate on the unpruned so-called dense networks, but then you will lose some of the possible performance. Uh, so this step one is actually optional. And within this step, what you actually are doing, you are removing some of these connections uh, that connect uh, neurons from different layers, and this is called pruning. Uh, by doing so, you basically uh, reduce the, the compute requirements for processing this network, uh, and also you uh, reduce the memory requirements for storing the network parameters. But as I said, this step one is optional, so you can skip it if you like. Uh, we, have developed, uh, we have developed our own pruning algorithms that you can use within the Keras, for example, but you can also use any other uh, pruning library that is becoming ever more available uh, to actually do this pruning. Uh, it's, it's not related. How you prune your network is not uh, of relevance uh, for the deep ocean core as itself, because the next step is actually the step that is mandatory, and uh, we call it the translation step, where you then take your CNN network model, for example, uh, Keras model, and then run it through this tool that we call uh, a deep translator tool, which then creates a binary description uh, in, the, in the form of a, of a binary linked list, uh, which actually describes the, uh, the characteristics or the architecture of the network that should be uh, executed on the deep ocean. So this stage uh, or step two is uh, necessary always because it basically, uh, takes a high level description of your CNN network, a Keras model, and then generates automatically uh, a binary description, which can then be downloaded into operating memory in step three uh, uh, within the camera or attached to an FPGA device. So we download this bitstream uh, and basically start the, the devotion accelerator and it starts processing this, uh, this specific uh, CNN network. So uh, running a network on the deep ocean is basically a two-step process if you don't want to uh, prune it before. Uh, but pruning is extremely useful. Uh, and what we do uh, when we prune the network, basically, as I said, we remove some of the parameters. And uh, on this slide, there is an example. For example, uh, within every convolutional layer, you have these convolutional kernels or filters. Uh, which, is, which are actually uh, 3D structures of coefficients or weight values, uh, which are used to basically detect features in the input feature map. Uh, and uh, while you are training your network, uh, these, these representations of these kernels are so-called dense representations because every of these coefficient, in this example, it's a three by three by five kernel, for example. Uh, so we have, uh, 45 different parameters within this one kernel. 
But what we can do, we can remove some of these parameters. And when I say remove, I think uh, we can set them to zero. And uh, by setting them to zero, uh, we don't have to uh, jeopardize our accuracy of the network. So it can be done in a way that basically you effectively remove a certain percentage of uh, parameters while still having the accuracy of the initial original dense convolutional neural network. And by removing these parameters, basically uh, you have simplified the model of your network and then you can take benefit uh, potentially when you are processing it. And anyhow, you can benefit uh, because uh, you can compress these sparse representations and basically store only these non-zero values uh, inside the memory. And therefore, uh, if nothing else, pruning reduces your memory footprint of your, of your network. But it can also improve performance if the computing system is designed to basically take benefit of this, uh, of this uh, sparse representation. And Deep Ocean Core is actually designed to benefit from this sparsity in the pruned networks. And therefore, uh, it is strongly recommended uh, to prune your networks before running them on the, on the deep ocean. Now, uh, maybe to, uh, to explain a little bit more how we actually do this translation. Uh, this is an important step. So uh, <clears throat> the translation takes a, a high level model of the, of the CNN network uh, described uh, as stacked layers. In this example, two convolutional layers followed by a pooling layer and then fully connected layer. And what we do in the translation process, first, we actually uh, assign a binary uh, node in a, in a linked list representation, uh, which describes the characteristics of each of these layers. And each layer, each, each layer node, or how we call it descriptor node, then points to the next layer in the, in the network architecture. And this is then this linked list, list representation. Uh, what we also do uh, in the translation phase, we actually convert the floating point number representations to a fixed point number representation. Uh, it, it has also been shown uh, that you don't need to use floating point arithmetic when you are processing CNNs, especially in the inference phase. Uh, it is sufficient to use a fixed point implementation uh, of various bit widths. Uh, the question is now still open, what is the uh, least amount of bits that you need uh, to be able to accurately still process uh, CNN network. But uh, this is what we do. Uh, Deep Ocean Core actually uses a 16-bit fixed point number representation. And uh, within the translation process, we actually uh, discover automatically the optimal 16-bit fixed point representation uh, to encode both the coefficient values uh, from the convolutional kernels and fully connected weights and also the feature map uh, or data values that, that are actually being generated as the network is processing input images. Uh, and we are also compressing these sparse kernels. So we have a specific number uh, uh, compression format that is used to store this sparse representation of the kernel. So basically these three steps uh, are performed uh, during the translation process. And we start uh, with the abstract model Keras model in our uh, case, and we end up with the binary uh, file that can then be downloaded uh, into a memory. And uh, <clears throat> there are a number of benefits why, uh, why to use this binary linked list uh, representation. First of all, uh, it allows you to easily dynamically switch the network that you would like to run on the deep ocean. Because uh, from, from this, uh, diagram, you can see uh, a general organization of the system. So you have an FPGA device uh, implementing the deep ocean and it's communicating via the memory controller to attached memory. And inside the memory, you can have a number of these binary descriptions of different networks that you would like to run at one time uh, during the operation. And uh, basically uh, to select which network you would like to run, the only thing that is needed is to tell by writing into one register uh, of the deep ocean core, uh, where is the starting or the base address of that binary linked list uh, description. 
And once uh, you point the potion to the beginning of the selected uh, linked list, it will basically execute uh, the CNN network that is described by that uh, binary linked list. And if you want to switch or change the networks, the only thing that you have to do if the networks are already loaded into the memory, uh, you simply have to change one pointer value in the deep ocean core and it immediately starts running different network. So the, the dynamic switching basically takes, I don't know, less than a millisecond for sure. Uh, so it's, it's extremely fast, but you can also do, you can even uh, run networks with uh, changing topology. So basically you can have a situation which is presented here. So you can have a network stacked of, of, of a number of layers, but uh, envision a situation where you, based on some conditions, would like to change one layer, replace it with another one. Because we have this linked list representation that's, that's quite easy to do, because you only have to rewire a couple of pointers in this linked list representation, and immediately the core runs a different network. So you can switch the complete networks, but you can also switch the layers or replace the layers within the, within the system. Uh, so, uh, and all this is possible uh, because of usage of this linked list representation. And bear in mind, we don't have to change anything about the architecture of the, of the core itself because it is a universal core. So basically it does not care uh, what CNN description it is operating on. Uh, that, that does not change its internal architecture. There is no need for that. So there is no need to reprogram the FPGA if you want to uh, select and run different networks. And uh, this basically dynamic CNN switching has uh, many advantages in actual applications because it can simplify development of the complete system. Uh, for example, uh, this is one hypothetical uh, example uh, where, for example, we would like to do some anomaly detection or quality control uh, in the production line where we have different types of products. And uh, within each uh, product category, we have different uh, types of potential faults that we would like to discover. So here I have, I don't know, Apple product category and peer Apple product category. And uh, within the apples, I have fault one, two until N different type of faults that I would like to somehow detect and signal to the system. Uh, but in the peer category, product category, I have different types of faults. Uh, and I would like to develop a deep learning system that is capable of doing all this uh, automatically. So I could, of course, uh, develop an object localizer, uh, which first localizes and then classifies automatically at the same time uh, every uh, product specific category, but this would be an extremely difficult task. Uh, and it would be uh, very difficult to train such a network because it has to do an object localization and the classification uh, at the same time. And uh, even if you are being able to train it, the network probably will be too complex uh, and too big and it will then run slow on your uh, edge. But with the dynamic switching approach, you can basically separate this task into two steps. So in the first step, you only train a simple object localizer, which actually has to detect and localize only two different classes, apples and peers, nothing else. And this is much simpler than the scenario I started with. And then once you know which class you are working with now, then you deploy a specialized object classification network, which is then trained to, for example, look for these n different faults in the Apple product category, or if it is a peer, then we have a, a third network, which then basically is trained only to classify the faults in the peer product category. And now you have to train instead of one big complex network, you are now training three networks but which are much simpler because their underlying tasks are much simpler. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, reasonable to assume that uh, the training will be much easier in this scenario. And also the, the, the sizes and the complexities of these three networks should be uh, much, much smaller uh, compared to this uh, network that, that, that we started with. Uh, 
And of course, this, this, uh, this uh, system can be easily implemented using the deep ocean core because uh, we can easily on the fly do this uh, selection of the network that we would like to run next. Uh, so this can be easily implemented uh, using a deep ocean. And uh, at the end, um, I would like only to briefly comment on the on the current performance numbers of the of the core. Uh, so in this in this table, you can see uh, inference uh, inference time latencies for uh, these uh, CNN uh, architectures. So these 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 rows, uh, except the last two, actually. Uh, are the classification CNN architectures and the last two rows uh, present uh, object localizers, uh, SSD architectures. So you can see the, the, the latency and frame rate values. Uh, for the system, which is, uh, which is built, built uh, using an Xilinx FPGA ZCU3 uh, device, uh, which operates at uh, 245 megahertz. And the deep ocean core is configured uh, to use 64 so-called compute cores. Uh, I did not have time to go into details about the internal architecture of the core, but it is composed of, of, a, of, a, of a building blocks, which we call the compute core. And you can, you can scale the core uh, by adding more uh, compute cores and then get more performance. So these are the numbers. Uh, bear in mind that these numbers uh, are numbers that we are getting with the current version of the deep ocean. But uh, as I said, the deep ocean core is still being developed and we are, we are hoping and we are pretty certain that we can significantly improve these numbers in the, in the up, upcoming year, for example. Uh, what is also an important metric uh, when you are doing uh, processing on the edge is actually, uh, uh, power efficiency when you are doing the, the, the inference. So, uh, of course, you would like to know how fast you can process your data. That would be then a frame rate or how much time it takes to process it. That would be latency. But uh, usually you are also interested uh, in knowing how, how much energy or power you need to spend in order to process, for example, one input image. Uh, so this this graph actually shows you uh, a comparison between the deep ocean and some other solutions. Uh, when uh, inference efficiency, uh, which is now presented in um, the number of uh, input images that you can process uh, per one second, per one watt of energy, uh, where you can see uh, how the deep ocean uh, compares with uh, some, of the, some of the existing solutions in terms of this uh, power efficiency. And uh, also we are hoping because uh, we, are, we are pretty certain that we can still improve its uh, compute performance that actually these numbers will uh, improve also over the time. Uh, that would be all uh, from my side. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining this uh, presentation and uh, yeah, if you have some questions, I think we can we can go to that stage. Markus, back to you. Thank you very much, Rastislav. Um, before we start to get to the questions, please answer um, a small poll. Mm, now you should get it. Yes. Um, please answer them, and when you have questions, please use the Q and A window to um, yeah get your answers, your question answered. So the first question is, how much memory can you save using pruning? What speed up do you reach with pruning? Uh, well, it, it depends, of course. Uh, usually, uh, the pruning depends on the layer type that is being pruned. Uh, if you are talking about the fully connected layers, uh, they can be pruned. Uh, you, you can remove 90% uh, of the weights, even more. Uh, so 
in the in the fully connected uh, layer, which is actually most demanding in terms of memory footprint, because in the fully connected layer, each neuron from that layer uh, has its own specific weights uh, that that are connected to all the uh, let me say neurons from the previous layers. Uh, so in the fully connected layers, it's 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 ex you can expect to remove up to ninety percent. It could be even higher. Of course, it could be lower. Uh, when we talk about uh, convolutional layers, usually the numbers are between uh, forty percent and seventy percent. So that's that's somehow uh, the the range. Uh, the the amount of weights or coefficients that you can remove uh, is the smallest uh, if the layer are closer to the beginning of the network. So the first layers cannot be pruned that significantly. But as you go deeper in the network, you can remove more and more layers. So uh, basically, you, you, you can save a lot in terms of memory by pruning. Uh, in terms of processing performance, it's not that easy because uh, now, uh, how you can save time? Because you can skip all these operations that actually uh, involve zero valued uh, operand. And if your parameter or weight is zero, you don't have to multiply it with the input value. You don't have to accumulate zero to the running sum. So this is what is called zero skipping in the, in the, in the, in the field of hardware acceleration. And therefore, if you are able to skip this operation sufficiently, then you are saving your, saving your clocks. Uh, and uh, then the time needed to process pruned convolutional or fully connected layer, of course, gets shorter. Uh, the problem is that uh, it's, it's, it's not that easy to say how much time you, you, you actually save by processing pruning networks because uh, the time it takes to process layers strongly depends on the layer configuration so, and, and its position. Uh, so for example, one would say, okay, this is great in the fully connected layers, I can then uh, save 90% of clock cycles, uh, which is certainly true, but the amount of time that you actually uh, spend on processing fully connected layer is only a fraction of the amount of time that you are spending processing all the convolutional layers. So yes, you are there, there you are saving 90% of the time, but that at the end could be maybe two or 3% of the total network compute time. Uh, but as a, as, a, as a rough estimation, you could expect to uh, half the processing time, let me say it like that. So you can speed up the, 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 the process at least two times. Okay, thank you very much. So the next question, uh, what does the deep ocean is an accelerator cost for small business or edge ML researcher? Uh, yes, that's, that's a good question. Unfortunately, I cannot answer that. Uh, uh, because uh, the, the deep ocean is dominantly developed to be used uh, within the IDS products. I'm not sure is it commercially or even academic, academically available for the public, uh, but I could be wrong. Uh, my suggestion would be to, to, to contact uh, either me and then I can point you to somebody within the IDS that will have the answer or direct, directly contacting uh, the, the IDS. Okay, thank you. Then another question, what is the process to evaluate the accuracy of the pruned network? Uh, well, you do that, uh, you basically do that uh, within the Keras environment or your deep learning uh, environment. Uh, you train your network as a dense model. And then after you are happy with the results, the accuracy, then you apply the pruning algorithm. Uh, and usually, uh, when you remove some of the connections, set them to zero, uh, the accuracy will, will go down. And then you have to do what is called a retraining. So you have to further train, but now this pruned version of your network, uh, to regain the accuracy. So uh, basically, you are using the same script, training script, which is a little bit augmented uh, to involve this pruning and then retraining steps. And you can, you can monitor the accuracy curves uh, as you would do anyhow uh, when you are training the dense model. So 
basically that's the that's the flow with the pruning so train the dense network prune retrain and usually this is done only once but this also depends on the pruning algorithm that you are using uh, there are also pruning algorithms that do this iterative pruning so they prune a little bit retrain then prune a little bit more retrain and so on uh, maybe one additional comment uh, this retraining takes much uh, much less time than the original dense network training. So it's usually only a fraction of time that you need to train your initial dense network. So um, don't, be, don't be scared that, okay, I have to wait 10 days to train my network and then additional 10 days to prune it. No, that will, that will never be the case. So uh, again, I, I cannot give you uh, a precise a number how much additional time you will spend but usually it's maybe additional 10 percent or something like that it again it depends uh, on the on the pruning algorithm that you have selected for the pruning and uh, basically how far you would like to go because if you prune more then it, it's it's reasonable to expect that you will have to train more uh, in order to uh, regain the accuracy and of course you cannot prune as much as you like uh, there is always a, this kind of a threshold. If you go over this threshold, then your accuracy severely drops. And no matter how much you retrain after it, you cannot regain the, the original accuracy. So the pruning can be done or should be done carefully uh, and uh, not overdo it. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, the last two questions. So um, if I got right, then the CNN model stays in the DDR RAM all the time doing the inference. Uh, wouldn't it be faster to run parts of the model in the internal memory of the FPGA? Of course, of course, if your FPGA is big enough. Uh, that's, the, that's the question. So uh, the, 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 the deep ocean basically does not care where this memory is located. And of course, it would be extremely power beneficial if you cache the, the network and also all the intermediate data inside of the FPGA. But for that, you have to have a larger FPGA device. If you can afford it, then you, you, you will be even more power efficient because these, these graphs that I shown actually are power efficiency when the data, all the data is actually stored externally. So uh, the power efficiency will be improved if you cache the, the data in the FPGA. And also, I think the compute performance will be also improved because you will remove this latency on the DDR, DDR link. So you are completely correct that that, that would be an ideal solution. But uh, edge devices usually uh, do not, uh, do not um, allow using these huge FPGA devices. And then usually you, you, you cannot do it. You have to have an external DDR memory. Okay, thank you. And now uh, one question is um, asked, um, very often. <clears throat> Can you go to the power slide and explain more about the power consumption and about the, and what is the impact of the memory subsystem on the overall performance and energy figures? Yeah, so this is yeah. asked very often. Yeah, so basically this is, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, a power efficiency uh, when the power consumption of the core itself is taken into account. So it's not a power efficiency of the complete system, especially because uh, it, it, it will strongly depend on the architecture of your complete system. If it is uh, an external DDR memory, then, uh, then if you are also taking that into account, then the numbers will change. If it is stored internally in the FPGA, then the numbers uh, will be uh, closely resembling these that I shown. So uh, these numbers are uh, computed or calculated, taking the power consumption of the accelerator itself, not the complete system. Okay, thank you. So one last question because it's short, is quantization is supported? Uh, not in a sense that you can select the, 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 the desired bit width. So currently we do a quantization but it's always floating point to 16 bit fixed point. So, uh, and therefore we, we, we do the quantization of the coefficients, but all, only all, always to the 16 bit number representation. You cannot select, for example, eight bit or four bit representation. 
at the moment, but uh, in the development plan, uh, we plan to uh, basically switch to 8-bit uh, number format, fixed point number format, uh, and probably support variable uh, bit widths to a degree, uh, because that would make sense. For example, some layer uh, would benefit if they're using a 16-bit uh, fixed point, while the others are using 8-bit or even 4-bit. But then you have this variable bit width accelerator and uh, the devotion currently cannot support it. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Rasislav. So we want to thank again uh, every TinyML talk sponsors. And if you're interested by um, be a sponsor by yourself, please contact um, on the email at olga at tinyml.org for more information. So ARM, the Software and Hardware Foundation for TinyML. Deep Light, we use AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Edge Impulse, TinyML for all developer. Maxim Integrated, the new Max 70,000 implements AI influence at low energy levels, enabling complex audio and video influencing to run small on small batteries. Kixo AutoML, automated machine learning platform that builds tiny ML solutions for the edge using sensor data. Reality AI at advanced sensing to your product with edge AI and tiny ML. And Syncense builds sensing and influence hardware for ultra low power embedded mobile and edge devices. And are you a small and medium sized enterprise from Germany? Uh, we have an offer for you. If you need AI training events or development projects for your application, uh, please contact us and we can help you with the KELM Labs. The next time ML talk will be from Bernhard Sam. Um, he's a machine learning product manager at MathWorks and he will talk about deploying AI to embedded systems on Tuesday. Um, April the 1st, um, and it will start at 8 a.m. Pacific time. If you're interested by yourself and you have an interesting topic for the talks, please contact talks at tinyml.org and we can um, make a date for your talk. So now we want to thank you, um, thank every um, petition of this talk, want to thank uh, Ratislav for your talk. This was really, really interesting. 